Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us this afternoon for our what we hope is our monthly Q and A with uh, with 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 myself. Um, I'm David Root. I'm the executive director at Homeward Alliance. Um, for those of you who were here who were here when we did this last month, um, and for those of you who weren't, just a sort of overview of what these sessions are. Um, we are trying to do sessions where uh, community members can have an opportunity to ask questions of me and other staff members potentially um, at Homeward Alliance, but also uh, trying to infuse some presentation materials or some presentations into these into these. So it's not just a Q and A. Um, so there will be, or so it's not always just a Q and A. So there will be some months where it is just a Q and A, where it's just where it's just me, and I'll have a brief, you know, kind of overview of what's happening with Homeward Alliance and just in general, you know, big picture community up updates, those sorts of things. And then there were, and, and then there will be other months where it'll be, we'll have more of a topic that I'll focus on for the beginning of the presentation, and then we'll go into a QA. and a and, um, and then other months we'll probably have me and other staff members uh, doing these presentations together. This month it is just going to be me, so you're stuck with me. Um, but, um, but in any case, there will be plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, after after we're done with the, the presentation section of this. Um, and I would encourage you to just start, if you have questions as we go, just put them in the chat and we'll make sure they all get addressed. Um, and then at the and then when I'm at the end of the uh, <clears throat> at the end of the presentation, um, feel free to also just unmute yourself and and ask any questions that you have. Um, so for today's uh, presentation, we're we're going to be talking about, um, five myths around homelessness, um, and the there are a couple of reasons why we we chose this as a presentation topic. Um, one of them is that we, in the, I guess 13, year, 13 14, uh, four, almost yeah, fourteen years now that Homeward Alliance has been around. There's there's, there's sort of a consistent uh, set of questions that is frequently asked of us that. Um, um, that sometimes includes some misinformation, sometimes includes some misunderstandings about how, how we work, how things operate in the community, how our homelessness response system works. Um, and we just wanna, you know, have a, have sort of a, a share with you what our standard answers are to a lot of those questions. Um, and then and then I think the other really bigger reason, um, because I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of, if not all of you on this call are just looking at the names are already supporters of Homeward Alliance are already pretty deeply involved in the work around serving people experiencing homelessness. Um, one of the things that we hear from, from our followers frequently is how do I answer these questions? What do you say when you get these questions? And so we, we want to be able to provide you as, as our sort of voices and advocates out in the community with, um, with some of the, some of the same language that we use when we're answering these questions on a regular basis. Um, so, with no further ado, I will go into the myths that we will be discussing today. Um, the first myth is um, this a quote from, from Field of Dreams, for those of you who, who haven't seen the movie, if you build it, they will come. And the common argument, or the sort of myth that, that, uh, that this is associated with, is the belief that if we have services in a community, if we increase services, if we have, if we improve our services, um, basically, if our services are are providing uh, too good of care to people who are homeless or escaping homelessness, that we will attract other people to be uh, to to our community who are homeless, and therefore we will end up with a larger homeless problem than we would otherwise have. So, um, this is a pretty. Uh, I would say of all of the myths that we're gonna to discuss today, um, this might be the most difficult for us to overcome as an agency because it's really infused how I think uh, our culture thinks about homelessness. Um, it's certainly infused in how some some funders, some grantors, influential community members, not just in Fort Collins, but across the whole country, how people think about homelessness. Um, and if this is a fundamental belief that you have just as a, as a person, it's going to, it's, it's going to have profound effects on how you seek to address the issue of homelessness. Um, so just start by acknowledging that, you know, with, with, each of, with, with, with each of these myths, I'm just going to start by acknowledging where, where, I, where we think they come from and sort of the, 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 the sort of kernel of truth that exists um, that, that the myth is then built upon. And in this case, the, 
the sort of the, the part of this that is true is that when you have a community like Fort Collins that is surrounded by communities with less services, uh, particularly when you have a community uh, or a, a larger city that is surrounded by more rural areas where services don't exist or don't need to exist because the problem isn't as robust as it is in the in the in the neighboring cities, that it, that people will come from those surrounding locations to access services. So, in the case of Fort Collins, in the case of Loveland, just Larimer County in general, um, services are concentrated in services are concentrated in Fort Collins, with certainly services growing substantially in Loveland over the last year. And so it is It is true that we see a sort of regional migration of people um, between Larimer and Weld counties um, accessing services at the different at the different day shelters, the different overnight shelters, resource centers and all of those different areas. Um, so there is definitely a sort of transitory element to homelessness that exists on a regional basis. Um, and it's a big part of why we take a regional approach to solving homelessness. Um, for those of you who don't know, one of our, or sort of the the, the overseeing body um, that um, our official planning entity representing Northern Colorado, uh, Larimer and Weld counties, is the Northern Colorado Continuum of Care. This is a group comprised of representatives from local nonprofits, government, uh, just key, sort of key stakeholders in the issue of homelessness. Um, <coughs> excuse me that is responsible for overseeing this broad homelessness response system and making sure that we're coordinated as a region so that if somebody is seeking services in Loveland, Fort Collins, or Greeley, that those services are coordinated, people are being assessed according to the same tools, they're being added to the same list of people experiencing homelessness, the same data system, um, and, and despite that transitory nature, we can still continue to provide sort of a, 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 a seamless, um, we, we can provide services in a seamless way. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So when it comes to how we how we sort of rebut this argument um, in general or why we believe this is a myth, there are a few a few key things. First of all, our internal data. Our internal data is very clear about the fact that people do not come here for services. Um, for several years, we have actually asked the question, uh, or for several years, we actually did ask the question, why did you come to Fort Collins uh, when, when we checked people in, or sorry, when we were doing intakes at the Murphy Center for the first time, and we asked people why they, sorry, in addition to why they why they came here, whether they planned on staying here. And overwhelmingly, uh, what we found is that people did not come here for services, um, that people came here for really all of the same reasons that that most people come to Fort Collins or Northern Colorado because it's a great place to live, the, the, the climate, job opportunities, the, the idea of housing opportunities, they have friends or family in the area. Um, and the overwhelming majority of people who come to the Murphy Center do plan to stay in Larimer County, even if they're from an outside area. Um, I think it's I think it would be unrealistic of us, given given the sort of dynamics of Northern Colorado and how popular it, it has become, how popular it continues to, or how the, that popularity continues to grow. I think it would be unrealistic of us to think that nobody is going to migrate to Fort Collins from other locations. Um, plenty of people who are not homeless come to Fort Collins every single year. And in fact, I think one of the best rebuttals I heard to this argument was I was in a meeting once and uh, the person who was asked this question uh, asked uh, this large group of, um, of just different stakeholders in the homelessness response system, how many of you are from Northern Colorado? Um, and just a couple of, you know, a couple of the 30 or so people in the room raised their hands. The vast majority were from elsewhere. And I think it just speaks to the nature of Fort Collins. I'm not from Fort Collins, and I came here for a lot of the same reasons that, that the people who we see who are homeless came here. I came here for family and friends, and I came here because I loved the area, and this is where I wanted to live and work. We see that same thing with our, with our folks. Um, another key data point that we, <coughs> excuse me, another key data point that we point to is, is, is that if services were what was drawing people to Fort Collins, um, I think we would expect to see an increase of people who are homeless in the summer months accessing services at the Murphy Center, which is our you know, community's hub of resources. And in fact, we see the exact opposite. When we see travelers, people traveling through Fort Collins start to come to the city in the city, well, just the region actually, over the summer months, we actually see a decrease in the number of people accessing services on a day-to-day -day basis at the Murphy Center, which, tells me that clearly people are coming here to 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 um, <clears throat> to participate in other activities that are not that are not service based. Um, and I would say primarily I see I, I think I saw Andy on the call from OFC. I think uh, for Andy and OFC, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 
the 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 flip side of that is true because they're out on the streets. I think they see more people during the summer months because people are downtown more. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the, that that those individuals are accessing services. Um, excuse me. Another key point I like to make around this is that this argument, this argument that sort of if you build it, they will come, is made everywhere, all across the country, um, and it's it's a it's problematic when you see each community that is serving people who are homeless making this argument because I think really if if you do what what I like to do with this is take this argument to its logical conclusion, where does that leave us? If you take this argument to its logical conclusion, we would just eliminate services for people experiencing homelessness and we would expect somehow the numbers of people who are homeless to magically drop. Well, let's just concede, even though it's not true let's just let's just say that of the 5,000 or so people that Homeward Alliance serves on a data basis on, on, on an annual basis um, let's just say 10 percent came here because of services it's not true but let's just let's just say it is that'd be 500 people that means we have 4,500 people who are already here who are in need of services um, who are going to be far more desperate than they otherwise would be um, much less likely to escape homelessness and what we would see is a far more visible problem a far more acute problem um, and just just a, a, a less healthy community all across the board. And I would just ask, do we really want to be that community that just sort of passes the buck to the community next to us? All right, um, next, next item or next myth, people choose homelessness. So this is another one that we hear a lot. And I think the basis for this, excuse me, I think the basis for this is that a lot of people have heard people say these very words, I'm choosing to be homeless. Um, and so I do want to acknowledge that, of course, there are people who you could go up to and ask, why are you homeless? And they'll say, well, I, this is my lifestyle. I want to live like this. Um, and I don't want to diminish with my sort of counter argument here. I don't want to diminish the element of personal choice and that it is, you know, any individual's choice to live their lives the way that live their life, the way that they want to live. However, I think of a quote, and actually Pam, Pam reminded me of this quote earlier today from a client who said, after getting housing, he said, I, I always told people I was homeless because, I, I, sorry, I always told people I was homeless by choice because I thought that was the only choice I had. And this is the fundamental rebuttal that we use frequently to this argument. The choice that people make to experience homelessness is not a choice so much as it is a forced choice in the context of an impossible situation. And I would challenge everyone on this call to imagine just how awful your life would have to be for you to say, I'm choosing homelessness and that to be the best choice. The people we serve are often emerging from generate from years, if not generations of, of, of trauma, um, sitting in the Murphy Center for even, you know, 10 minutes and watching 15 people come in. It is not a coincidence that a huge percentage of people who are chronically homeless are suffering from debilitating, disabling conditions, chronic mental health or physical conditions, chronic chronic health conditions, substance use disorders, severe issues, severe histories of trauma, violence, um, all sorts of things in their past that have led to this uh, to this end result of homelessness. <clears throat> that in our mind is not really a choice so much as it is a choice in a context of having no other choices. Okay, um, third myth, everyone who is homeless has mental health or drug abuse issues. I think when we uh, just sort of for, for the average person, and I would just acknowledge even, even for myself, if you were to tell me to close your close my eyes and imagine a person who is homeless, it's pretty hard to not imagine the sort of stereotype of a person who's experiencing homelessness, you know, being chronically homeless, um, you know, unkempt, shopping cart, whatever it is, whatever all the sort of stereotypical things that you imagine. The, the visible element of homelessness, however, is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I could, you know, there, there, there are graphics that, 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 that exist out there if you want to Google homelessness and iceberg that demonstrate or that show you very clearly that there's, you know, a small percentage, maybe five to 10 percent of people sort of at the top of the iceberg who are the most visible, uh, the most visible segment of the homeless population. Um, and then you have about 90 to 95 percent who are sort of beneath that iceberg who we refer to as, 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 as the as the invisible homeless. Now, this is not to say that people who are homeless don't frequently have mental health 
or substance use issues or physical disabilities. Um, what it is saying, what, what I am trying to say is that the people who we serve on a day-to-day -day basis, the sort of regulars at the Murphy Center who come in every day, the people who we work with for, for years to try to get to try to get into housing and then try to help them maintain housing, frequently are chronically homeless, which means that they have been homeless for a year or longer and have a disabling condition, which could be a mental health issue, a substance use issue, or a physical disability. So it is 100% true. 50% of the guests of the Murphy Center last year reported having some form of disabling condition, including 13% who reported having some sort of cognitive disability. However, it is also true that of the 5,000 people we serve on an annual basis, about half are families, and the vast majority of those families are doubled up, living with family and friends, staying in motels, uh, just sort of trying to get by. And it is also true that among the 5,000 people we serve on an annual basis, including families and individuals, the majority access services once, twice, maybe three times. It is a small minority of people who consume a disproportionate percentage of resources on a daily basis. And that is the segment of the population that is most visible to the community in general. And so we, uh, we attach the elements of that subset of people experiencing homelessness to the entire population of those who are homeless. Okay. Uh, myth number four, the answer to homelessness is to get a job. Again, I'll start by acknowledging the, the sort of reality of this uh, or the, the realistic elements of this, which is that for most people, as I just, as I just mentioned earlier, we have 5,000 people who are seeking services on a, on, on a regular basis, and the vast majority of those people require services only once, twice, or three times. Um, and for most of those individuals with lower acuity needs, uh, a job is a prerequisite to escaping homelessness. Um, it is, you know, the, the most likely form of income for most of the people we serve. I believe, uh, when, actually, we, when we did a supplemental question to our local point in time count several years ago, uh, which is our local annual uh, census of people experiencing homelessness, I think we found somewhere in the 40 to 50 percent range of people who were homeless actually reported having a job at the moment that they were surveyed while they were homeless. Um, the simple truth is that in Fort Collins and Larimer County, I should say, um, the uh, <clears throat> the gap between a living wage and sort of the, the, the average wage, and particularly among people who are homeless trying to get work, um, is, is, is a chasm. It is a, it is a gap that, um, that makes it almost impossible for people to escape homelessness by just getting a job. It is, it is much more common that people will need additional assistance beyond that. Um, Sorry. Uh, the other element to this that we that that I think is important to talk about, which really leads into the 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 final myth that we're going to discuss, is that it is astronomically more difficult to obtain a job and astronomically more difficult to keep a job when you are experiencing homelessness. Um, for one, um, there is significant stigma around home around the issue of homelessness, um, and I think uh, we have heard loud and clear from clients over the last decade plus that if they go into an interview and they have a large backpack or it, there's some sort of obvious indicator that they're experiencing homelessness, that they are treated differently than if the, uh, than if the employer assumes that they are, that they are not homeless. Um, there's also the reality of trying to keep a job while you're experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, I'm just, I think actually it's sort of apropos that we're having this conversation on a day when it's, when it's snowing for the first time outside all year, um, imagine, if you had a job and you were experiencing homelessness on a day like today, trying to simultaneously meet your basic needs, uh, you know, that you're clothed warmly enough, that you have the food that you, you know, you have, you have enough food for the day that you can get from where you slept last night to where your job is on time, that you can get back to the shelter on time for check-in. Um, those things are just extremely difficult. And what it means is that there is quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of turnover in uh, among the people who we help get jobs. And it's over, it's typically over 200 people a year who we help get jobs, but we don't see great retention rates among the people who get jobs who are homeless because of the difficulty of trying to maintain employment while you're homeless. Uh, the final myth I want to talk about relates to the, the last one, which is housing first means free housing for everyone. So, um, for those of you who are not familiar, housing first is a is a is a principle. It's a very simple it's a very simple principle with a very simple premise, and it basically says that housing is a prerequisite to everything else. That if you are not housed, um, 
that it will be very difficult to achieve really any of your other basic needs, any of your long-term goals, um, that it will be pretty close to impossible to move forward with, 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 your, with your life. And so in the terms, in the context of service provision, what Housing First means is that our first goal with everyone who comes in for services is to make sure that they get housing or that they can maintain housing. And from there, we build toward other goals. Now, having said that, there is a, a significant continuum of, of housing options for people depending on need. And I think this is where the myth really comes into play. Uh, in Fort Collins, we have two projects, uh, Mason, Mason Place and Redtail Ponds that are permanent supportive housing projects operated by Housing Catalyst. In Loveland, uh, Catholic Charities uh, is developing and Homeward Alliance will be a service provider at this site, uh, is developing a 54 unit permanent supportive housing project called St. Valentine. Um, and these, particular facility, our facilities, these particular apartment complexes are designed for people who are escaping chronic homelessness, who have disabling conditions, who are likely to need support either permanently or for the long term. It's not to say that people who move into Red Tail Ponds, Mason Place, or St. Valentine won't, won't eventually, in some cases, move on to a more independent living situation. It is to say that not everyone will, and those projects are designed to be permanent housing options for people who are are unable to secure or maintain housing without the support of services that are attached to, to those sites. Um, now, however, what we're talking about here with those three projects is 60 units at Redtail Ponds, 60 units at Mason Place, and 54 units at the Plant St. Valentine projects. Well, in our regional coordinated entry system, which is our sort of Northern Colorado Continuum of Care, Northern Colorado Continuum of Care's process for helping people escape homelessness, since 2016, we have helped at least 1,500 people across our continuum out of 2,000 or so who were identified escape homelessness. And obviously doing the math of those 1,500, a, a small minority moved into those permanent supportive housing projects. The vast majority achieved housing through other means, and that could be anything from the lightest touch services, uh, one-time you know, let's say one-time landlord engagement with no cost to the agency other than to us as an agency other than the time we spent engaging with the landlord uh, to rent assistance on a one-time basis or a two-time or a two-time basis um, to short-term case management and short-term rent assistance um, and really just an entire spectrum leading all the way up to that permanent supportive housing. So I think it's important to remember that Housing First does not just apply to those permanent supportive housing projects that are the most visible and make the biggest dent when it comes to chronic homelessness in our community. Housing First refers to the entire spectrum of services designed to help people maintain their housing quickly. And I would just reiterate, I think, I think you know, a service like Neighbor to Neighbor provides provides rent assistance to to to. to I actually don't know the numbers this year, but hundreds, if not thousands, of people on an annual basis. That is a form of a, that. That is a housing first intervention. The idea behind what neighbors to neighbors doing is let's keep people in their housing, or let's help people get into their housing with one-time rent assistance because the research shows us consistently that that is a much more cost-effective intervention for the community, and also an intervention that produces more. Uh, or better outcomes and more enduring outcomes than if we were to try to focus on other needs and then housing. Um, I think a big part of why this is such a misconception in the field is because for generations, we thought of this completely in, in, the, in complete opposite terms. Uh, the, the goal, even, even, even when I first started uh, just 10 years ago, um, we were still sort of in the last stages as, as, as the service as a service provider community of moving from this model of what we call housing ready uh, to housing first housing ready being the idea that you need to be you need to have enough income you need to have enough um, you need to be in a stable place you need to have all the tools at your disposal to be able to maintain housing before you're ready to get into housing and what we've seen is that again, the exact opposite is true, that housing is the tool that you need in order to achieve all those other goals and produce the most positive outcomes for the individuals who are escaping homelessness and the community at large. Um, so with that, I'm going to close my uh, presentation and uh, open it up to open it up to questions. Um, I, I received a, a a private message of question about the uh, um, 
about the new um, the new Fort Collins nuisance ordinance um, and what impact that will have on uh, or what impact yeah I'm sorry what impact that will have on homelessness and I think that's I think that sort of remains to be seen I mean I would say I would say just sort of broadly speaking that I think um, I think we have a an extremely progressive um, progressive community when it comes to working with people with people experiencing homelessness, um, and so I'm always uh, I'm always sort of careful to say that in general my experience with with city leaders working with police officers working you know first responders just in general is that punitive measures uh, taking punitive measures for people experiencing homelessness is a, is, a, is is a last is a last resort um, and I don't you know from all the conversations I've had with and anybody anybody who's with the city is welcome to speak up and uh, object object to what I'm saying here but just based on all of the experience I I, I have I I am confident um, in our city's ability to enforce um, to enforce ordinances that might not necessarily be my my first choice of ordinance without it being an overly punitive approach. Um, I think we have a, a, a balanced approach in our community relative to uh, uh, to solving homelessness. And then there's also just you know the reality uh, that members of city council are hearing about on a, on a regular basis that city leaders are. Um, that city leaders are hearing about on a regular basis that um, that there's an increased number of, of calls related to you know noise and parties and disturbances in general and, and the city has to be able to respond to a sort of confluence of issues so um, if this is a tool um, that, 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 that the city could use to address you know residents concerns in a, in a robust way um, I'm not going to come out and speak against it until uh, in, until or unless we see really negative unintended consequences for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, question for a question, just message to me, would you uh, describe what kind of support is provided at permanent supportive housing? That's a great question. So um, the uh, I'll just I'll just use Mason I'll use Mason Place as an example because Mason Place is a site where we have two uh, two full time case managers. It's housing catalyst property, but we have two case managers there. Um, the the supportive services available to residents at Red Tail, or sorry, Mason Place include our two case managers, uh, a peer specialist from Summit Stone. Um, excuse me, a peer some uh, sorry, a peer specialist from Summit Stone, a therapist who is uh, a housing a housing catalyst employee, um, front desk staff who are who have you know significant training in de escalation and just sort of working on task oriented services with uh, with with residents of Mason Place on a day to day basis. Um, and then it also involves a lot of sort of ancillary services, uh, different agencies coming. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention the VA has a case manager at uh, at, at, at Mason Place. But then it also includes a lot of ancillary services. So trying to um, one of our goals for for the St. Valentine projects and project in Loveland will be to try to uh, provide more robust, <coughs> excuse me, more, more robust wraparound health care services to people who are homeless. That's one of the most significant gaps that we've seen over the last several years, really underscored by the pandemic. Um, so yeah, it's it's the the services at a at a supportive housing project are purposely designed to be flexible because the needs of the people who are at the supportive housing projects are extremely diverse, um, and so we need to be equipped to to work with people with with a range of with a range of disabilities from physical disabilities to mental health issues to substance use disorders and sort of everything in between, if not if not all of those things, um, all of those things combined. Um, Okay, let's see, what am I missing here? Um, okay, sorry, there's a question. Uh, were people who were homeless interviewed, were they homeless when they arrived in Fort Collins or did they become homeless after arriving here? Um, it's a good question. It's a combination at the Murphy Center. Um, that we we do see a we do see a lot of people who come to the who come to the Murphy Center who um, are precariously housed at risk of homelessness, and we also see a, we also see a fair number of people who um, you know let's maybe maybe thought they had a job and it fell through, or thought they had a place to live and it fell through. Um, but the the simple answer to that question is the majority of people are already are are. Um, are already homeless when they uh, arrive at the Murphy Center. They were not necessarily homeless when they arrived in Fort Collins. 
Uh, there's a question about does uh, if Homeward if Homeward Alliance has a um, <clears throat> Has a stance on the new land development code. We don't have an we don't have an official stance on the uh, on the new land, land development codes, but we're we're very supportive of um, of some of the strategies that are that are in the land development code. Trying to <clears throat> excuse me, like you know, um, increased increased housing density, um, more financing options for affordable housing or incentives, I should say, for affordable housing and um, a diff uh, additional financing. Um, for, for for housing development. So, while we have not established an official position, I, I I think if I were to pull our board and our staff right now, it would be largely supportive. Um, I heard that it's bad to give people on the streets cash. Is that true? Um, thank you for that question. Um, that's actually a, that's actually a question that we should that 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 I. It's not it's not a myth, but it is it's it's it kind of goes with these questions because it's a very common question that we that we get. Um, I. I I'm going to give you a hedged answer to that question and say I don't think it's good or bad. Um, I think it's I think it's really up to the it's just up to the individual who's giving who's give, who's giving people who's giving people money. Um, I would say if you're giving someone who is who is homeless money is not going to of course solve the problem of homelessness. It's probably not going to solve it's in, in, I mean unless it's a obscene amount of money, it's probably also not going to solve that person's homelessness. Um, I think on the on the positive side, I think what you're what you're doing when you give someone who's homeless money is you're giving them a choice about what they can spend their money on, uh, which is a choice that people who are homeless don't have a lot on a day to day basis. They eat what is put in front of them. They sleep where they're where, where they're supposed to sleep. They go during the day where they're allowed to be during the day. And um, and so I think you're 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 you would be you're giving an L, you're giving an element of choice and you know even if it's just the ability to go inside into the grocery store and buy a pack of gum, um, you know the kind of thing that we take for granted on a day to day basis because it's just what you know it's just what what people do. Um, you're allowing a person to, to 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 sort of live even momentarily, sort of more of a what we would consider a, I guess a normal I hate using that word but a a more common uh, existence in our community. Uh, of course, the concern that people always have that they raise with this question is, well, should I give someone, you know, cash knowing, or I'm not comfortable with it, knowing that they're probably going to go inside and go inside to the liquor store and buy alcohol, or they're going to use it to buy drugs. And, um, and I think if that's something you're, you're uncomfortable about, then I, then I would say you should not give people who are homeless money who are asking for it. I think, I think that really just like, just like with any gift, um, maybe, well, I don't know, it's sort of a, personal opinion, but just I think with, with with any gift, if you give it, I think you give it with no strings attached, um, knowing that the person is going to spend it on what they want to spend it on and that you're not necessarily going to agree with what they spend it on. Um, I think that's sort of, you know, that's sort of true across the board. If I give my, uh, if I gave my nephew 50 bucks today, I probably wouldn't agree with how he spent it, but he's going to spend it on what he wants to spend it on. Um, and I think that's sort of, I think that's sort of a, a a little bit of a crude analogy because he's nine years old and I don't mean to equate our uh, clients to children, but it's a similar sort of mentality around gift giving. Um, someone wrote privately to me that sometimes giving gro grocery gift cards can alleviate that fear. And that's true. And grocery gift cards are something that we hand out frequently and allows people to you know, shop at a single store. We have, we have King Super's gift cards at the front desk at the Murphy Center. And those are, those are frequently distributed to people for all sorts of different reasons, usually incentive gift cards. I think I got all the questions that were messaged to me. If you have other questions, feel free to come off mute. Do I have any staff members who want to add to something I said wrong or correct me on anything? put people on the spot here. I'll share something. Go for it. Um, <clears throat> I, I first got connected to Homeward Alliance as a volunteer. Um, at that time, I was working at the school district and I had seen a Colorado an article about One Village, One Family, which was a family services program. And um, I got to work with a group of people that were helping a, a homeless family get housing. And about that time, Homer Alliance was asked to manage the Murphy Center. 
and my husband and I wanted to help. Um, but I, I had never spent very much time around people, adults who are experiencing homelessness. And they were, to me, it's, I'm kind of embarrassed to say they were a really intimidating group of people. And so I volunteered to do laundry and everybody knows now that I love to do laundry. Um, my dream is probably to retire and work with Woody and Pat and do the mobile laundry program. Um, I thought laundry would be a good way to just do help, help behind the scenes. But one of the things I quickly learned was that uh, while folks experiencing homelessness might look kind of scary if you're not used to it, used to um, working with, with people who have been on the streets, um, I quickly was able to see that they were individuals with really unique situations and different personalities and strengths and some were super funny and some were artists and um, some had great stories. And um, if you haven't had an opportunity yet to, um, to get to know the people that are experiencing homelessness, I would encourage you to consider volunteering at the Murphy Center or just talking to people that you see on the streets because I think that's probably the easiest way to dispel the myths is once you get to know folks as people, um, it just, a lot of those things just fall away. I would, uh, hello, are you there? Yep, go for it. I just want to concur with what Pam said. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't had a lot of experience with people experiencing homelessness until we started doing the mobile laundry. And I just have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know people at the Loveland Library who come to us on a weekly basis. And like she said, tell us their stories and, and talk about their community and how they help each other and give appreciation for the services that they get. And um, it's just really gratifying. I think one of the, I think one of the sort of eye openers, just in just in general, is to just sit at the front desk at the Murphy Center. To just sit behind that front desk, and um, for those of for those of you for those Murphy Center staff members who are on this call right now, you've seen me just sort of sitting there observing, <laughs> just kind of like marveling. Um, marveling more because I just think it's I just think that our staff has I, our staff across the board have just very difficult jobs and do a great job and do it with just grace and dignity and um but when you sit at the front desk of the murphy center it's hard to come away thinking oh yeah people the people we just saw are choosing this or there's an easy answer to this problem or you know yeah we'll be able to get this we'll be able to get this person in housing right away you know when 10 people in a row come up to the front desk who you know have experienced you know, something traumatic in their childhood. They have a traumatic brain injury. They have a, a debilitating, untreated uh, mental health disorder that has been an issue since they were children. Um, they don't have family support. They don't have, um, you know, so many different little elements um, that contribute to, to having a sort of successful successful is the wrong word, but that, that, that contribute to them not being able to, to, to live their lives the way they want to, to live the best versions of their lives. Um, and so I think just, just, just sitting there listening to people for, you know, a half an hour dispels, for me anyways, just dispels any of most of the myths that we, that we discussed that today. Um, David, um, can anyone hear me? Yep. We got you. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to second that. I found, you know, working in the garden this summer, I found a lot of times um, people just really enjoy um, talking to you and want to tell you their stories and just the opportunity to be heard. I think with, as you said, a lot of the things that they go through, standing in line to be on shelter or getting their food or whatever, and you know it doesn't allow for much time for them to interact and so i think uh, you it's not that they expect you to fix anything just listening to their stories they really seem to appreciate that the other the other question i had was is there any information just cuz i see this on next door a lot um about all the um 
bicycle thefts that go on in Fort Collins, and people always want to pin those on homeless people. And I doubt that that is truly the case as much as as people, but I don't know if there was any actual data that the police department has done or anything like that on if there are other rings and it's not always homeless people and well if there is somebody on the call who has specific data i'd be interested to hear it because i have not heard specific data around that uh -huh. but but i mean there's there's no doubt just being at the murphy center that bike theft is an issue um just among among the the, the population we're working with i i would say it's it's probably appears to be a more significant issue than it is because because among those who are stealing or selling stolen bike parts i think it's a um it's a small number of people with a lot of bikes um so if you you know if you were to drive by the drive by the murphy center right now you might see actually if you were to drive down bristlecone right now um <clears throat> if you were to drive down bristlecone right now you would see the you would see a lot of a lot of sort of almost like a chop shop of of of, of bike parts. Um, yeah, the other the other side of that coin, of course, is that probably no one gets their bikes stolen more than people who are homeless. Um, so I think it's a you know it's again again it's 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 a, it's a very small percentage of the population uh, that would or has stolen a bike, and a very large percentage of the population that's probably had their bikes stolen or damaged. Um, I don't know if anybody, if, if there's anybody from the city or anywhere that has any any data on on bike thefts, but uh, one of the things we do is try to encourage uh, people to register their bikes when they can. Um, of course, we have um, our bike repair program, so you know people, I think, just in general, with their bikes in better shape or more inclined to be more protective and take better care of their bikes, lock them up, that sort of thing. Um, I think and a have, shout I think out to Jay Bishop, who's who's on this call. He's one of our bike mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay, I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't I know if you have any um, feedback about this question. If not, just you can stay on mute. Calling him out. Um, Are we looking for another question? I, I did just want to add something to the bike theft thing. I think that what, what we see happen is our guests are so vulnerable and um, uh, and poverty stricken that, that I do sometimes wonder if uh, people that are, are criminals take advantage of our guests to, this is just speculation, to get them to steal bikes on their behalf or um, other things because when I think about the people we serve, I, I think they're an easy group to scapegoat. Um, but I think typically with, with theft and burglary and drugs that there's often the people that are really making the money and organizing that this are, are probably not our very vulnerable um, folks. Just read what Christina wrote. Um... Christina has a lot of experience working with people who are homeless, but she's sick, so she's not going to talk. I've worked with three really stigmatized communities, veterans, people experiencing homelessness, and people with HIV AIDS. There are so many assumptions about that people make about them, and all I can say is get to know the community. Take the time to volunteer or learn before you make an assumption to your own homework. It can be difficult, but it is being part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And I do agree. I think there's, there's nothing you can do there's nothing better than getting to know than getting to know people. And um, even if for me, that means just sitting there at the Murphy center and eavesdropping um, <laughs> to, to some extent, I think, you know, I, I think having, having a conversation with a person who you pass on the street is, 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 you know, if the person is, is interested and wants to have a conversation, um, you, you might learn something about that person that surprises you. And that might make you learn something about homelessness that surprises you. Thanks for sharing that, Christina. Mm -hmm. May may I add something um, that's come up? You know, there was an article in the Colorado about um, fentanyl and the vending machine we have, and questions like um, is giving someone Narcan and enabling them to use drugs. So, is this something that a myth that we can talk about? Either you, David, or Taylor, as our health initiative director. 
happy to give it a shot. But Taylor, you want? Do you want to? You would you prefer I start and you want to add? Yeah, you you go and I can add. Okay. Um. So the I think the the, the question the question is by having uh, uh, overdose reversal. Um, tools and training on how to uh, use Narcan to, redu to reduce, um, or sorry, to uh, reverse overdoses. And then also having fentanyl testing strips at the Murphy Center. Basically, are we enabling, enabling drug use? And this question gets applied to needle exchange programs as well by having needle exchange programs. Are we enabling um, or even encouraging drug use? Um, you're not gonna be surprised that my answer to that is no. Um, I think that, uh, and, and, it, and it is, it, I mean, it's it just like all of these myths, there is a, an element of logic that, that, that underpins it, that makes it seem like a, like, like a more valid argument than it, than it is, especially if you're not sort of ingrained in the work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I think, you know, for, for, for just sort of the average person who's approaching this issue, it is a bit counterintuitive to say the way to combat, um, um, bad outcomes related to drug use is by creating safer places for people to safer safer options for people to utilize drugs however what the research has shown um, and this is you know across the board for for decades now um, is that harm reduction strategies and that is exactly what we're talking about here uh, that is sort of recognizing that harmful things are, go are going to happen, um, but that we can take steps to reduce the potential harm that can be inflicted on, on, on people who are doing things that are potentially harmful. Harm reduction is a real thing and it is an effective strategy to combating these issues. Uh, when it comes to drug abuse, our goal of course is to connect people with treatment options whether that's therapy medication assisted treatment it you know it really varies widely for for for, for the individuals of course that's our goal but in the meantime our goal is also to keep people alive and that's really what these what these interventions are about it's about keeping people alive and then simultaneously when these interventions occur at a location like the murphy center or at northern colorado health network northern colorado health alliance at different places that are that are sort of equipped and have trained staff who work with people who are suffering from substance use disorders um, you open up the opportunity for treatment um, and often um, people will walk through that door and 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 start to start to get involved start to get involved in treatment. Um, so you know a needle exchange program is a great example. When you in our community's needle exchange program, you're not required to participate in any sort of services. You're not required to uh, to 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 try to stop using substances. But when you are receiving needles, when you're exchanging when you're exchanging your used needles. There is always that option of having a conversation with a counselor, of getting involved in treatment services, and just by having people with substance use disorders walking in a door that has service providers on site, we have increased the chances of that person surviving their drug addiction, their, 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 their substance use disorder, and we've increased the chances that they're going to seek treatment. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Taylor? Uh, no, I think you covered everything I would say. Um, the only thing I'll add, if anybody's curious about the vending machine that we do have at the Murphy Center, um, it does have fentanyl test strip kits, uh, naloxone, Narcan, overdose prevention kits, there's menstruation kits, and then some regular hygiene kits as well. And that's just uh, to really help with uh, sort of protecting the anonymity of the people who are accessing that vending machine. Um, and I also want to make it clear that that vending machine is accessible to anybody in the community. So you don't have to be a, a guest of the Murphy Center or literally experiencing homelessness to come in and access that machine. Um, so if you are just a concerned community member and you wanna be able to have um, Narcan on your person, in case there was an emergency that came up, uh, we welcome you to come access that from our facility. I, I didn't hear if you mentioned, are those other are pregnancy test kits included in that? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't believe that those are included in those. Just wondering if there might be a need for that, uh, but just something to think about. Yeah, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. 
Um, when I've um, when I've given tours at the Murphy Center, um, people have have shared that like they they have Narcan for like their elderly relatives who may be on opioids because sometimes you can forget and take too many, or folks who who have recovered or, or in recovery. Um, feel an obligation to carry it because they said it saved their life and they want to make sure that they can save someone else's. So um, I think that those are good reasons. Others, um, parents of teenagers, teenagers sometimes do stupid things and um, certainly you don't want their punishment for, for doing something to be deaf. And so it's, it's not a bad tool to have in your household for, for, for lots of reasons, right? Um, I also wanted to add that uh, Jay's not able to come off mute, but to Bridget's question about the bikes. So just as a reminder, Jay's on our bike repair team. Um, he said that um, typically the people that come to our bike repair program at the Murphy Center have a bike that they either bought for very cheap or they salvaged from the trash. Typically those bikes show signs of being ridden a lot, sometimes in unsafe state of repairs and are the only means of transportation they own. So it sounds like the people that um, are getting bike repairs aren't riding high-end bikes. Um, so maybe that's a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Christina mentioned she carries it all the time, have used it, very easy to use. Um, yeah, 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 you're, you, ha you have had the uh, misfortune of having to use it, but you've, saved lives with it so it's I, I carry i carry it as well i've never actually had to use it but i carry it um, with me all the time as well um there's a question um if the murphy center has an aa program and i'll just broaden that to say that the murphy center has a lot of substance use treatment programs um or substance use treatment options so typically if someone is is is, is uh so typically if someone is, is presenting with a substance use disorder they will um We'll try to we'll try to engage them with Summit Stone Health Partners, our community mental health agency, um, or our case managers if they're not interested in collecting in, in connecting with Summit Stone or other agencies' case managers. Um, a goal is always to connect people to treatment options, and that could be a variety of things. Some people do good. We don't have AA meetings at the actual Murphy Center, but pe but there are AA meetings all around the community. I think every day, um, and so if that's what people want as their option for treatment, that's where that's where we'll refer them. We also do a lot of referrals to medica medication assisted treatment at uh, Front Range Clinic, uh, therapeutic treatments via Summit Stone and other agencies, and so it's um, just, just sort of uh, bro broader than just AA. But the short answer is we have a, a lot of options for people who have who, who are seeking services, seeking treatment. We, David, I don't know if you mentioned that we do have a peer navigator on staff that can help uh, people connect to recovery services. And my favorite story about that program is that about a year or two ago, um, one of our, our clients reached out to that navigator and said that she wanted help quitting smoking. Um, and she was someone who was actually using meth. But for her, um, kind of like the, the no wrong door that her 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 starting point was to work on quitting smoking. And um, and that's kind of where the peer navigator met her and was able to help her with that. And then ultimately that led to treatment for um, her other addictions. Um, I just, uh, one of our staff members just mentioned to me that um, our, peer nav our peer navigator is starting a uh, recovery group at the Murphy Center. Well, we are running short on time. I guess um, are there are there any other burning burning questions from folks? Okay. Well, then we'll let you all go a few minutes early. <laughs> um, very much appreciate you all attending today, and um, yeah, I hope you all have a great rest of your week weekend. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, David. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.